Hello everyone. In this video we're going to be taking on a big project. And we're going to be restoring this magnificent two horsepower century motor. Uh, this particular motor is a four pole, 1750 RPM. It has a P7 frame and it has the patent dates of 1899 and 1903. Uh, this motor is very heavy. It weighs approximately 225 pounds. Uh, plus just that pulley alone weighs eight pounds. Um, so this thing is really beefy in the construction and uh, I think that you're going to enjoy following along on the restoration of this beautiful piece. So um, I'm going to bring the camera around to the other side just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about and just to show you the wires coming out of the uh, wiring harness there you'll be surprised to see uh, how beefy the construction on this thing really is. So these wires are about 5 sixteenths of an inch uh, in diameter, which is uh, pretty amazing, really. So they are definitely heavy duty. I also have a copy here of the 1916 uh, Century Catalog, and even the catalog is really high quality. Uh, it has beautiful embossing on it. I mean, it's just uh, everything that this company made, they took a lot of pride when they made it at that time. And on page 11, right down here, you can see an exploded diagram of a uh, two horsepower motor. So we're going to uh, tear into this motor and we're going to take our time. We're going to do a uh, thorough job on it and uh, hopefully when it's done this motor is going to make a statement. Okay, so this rotor is going to be the next part to come out, and I'm sure that this rotor is very heavy. It's probably at least 40 or 50 pounds, so I'm going to take it out to the front of the motor, and uh, while I'm taking it out, I'm going to be real careful not to bang those windings while I'm removing it, because uh, it'd be real easy to damage the windings. Okay, so now I'm removing the tag. Uh, this tag is really in beautiful condition, so uh, we're going to just preserve it just the way it is. Okay, so I got the uh, camera zoomed in here so that you can see a close-up of the brush holding mechanism. Uh, the way that this works is the carbon brush fits in there like that. Okay, this bolt here, it's like a gib screw, and that adjusts the amount of tension that's on that brush. And this brush should be free to move around without too much friction on it, so it should be able to go up and down like that. Now, if I take the brush back out of here, you can see there's a flat spring right here. And right here, this part, and the part that sticks out there, they call that a finger. And what that does is, when the fly weights that are attached to the rotor open up as the motor reaches about 75% of its speed, there's a, uh, a mechanism that comes and it pushes these fingers down. And as it pushes the fingers down, it moves the spring down. 
And what that does is it releases the pressure off the carbon brushes. It doesn't pull the brushes away from the commutator, but by moving the spring down, this mechanism takes the pressure off of them. And the purpose of that is to reduce the amount of wear on the carbon brushes, because while the motor's running, the carbon brushes don't have any pressure on them pushing against the uh, commutator. And it also reduces the amount of noise that the motor makes while it's running. So it is imperative that all these mechanisms are free to operate uh, without any undue friction so that the carbon brushes move in and out of there freely. Now occasionally you'll find a motor where these little fingers are worn out. Those fingers do not serve any electrical purpose. So if you were in a situation where your motor had fingers that were worn out here, the best thing that you could do is just grind them off because what will happen in that instance is the brushes just won't pull away from the commutator and they'll just be riding on there all the time while it's Okay, so this brush holder assembly just unscrews off of this end bell. And uh, you need to be careful when you're going to unscrew it, not to put too much pressure on any one of these flanges because uh, if one of those breaks off, you're gonna be uh, up the creek without a paddle. So before I unscrew that, I'm gonna take a couple more seconds and show you the interaction of this piece and the rotor. So let me set that up and we'll bring you guys right back. Okay, so in order to show you the interaction between the brush holder assembly and the rotor i'm going to first show you how this rotor works so inside of here there's a spring and that spring is under uh, quite a bit of tension and there's also a short circuiting necklace inside of there on the back side of the rotor you have these flyweights so the way that that works is the motor starts off in repulsion mode hence the name repulsion induction when it gets up to about 75% of its rated RPMs, these flyweights will fly open. When they fly open, there's two little rods in here. The centrifugal force will overcome the tension that's on the spring, and this ring will move forward, and when that moves forward, two things will happen. Number one, the shorting necklace will move forward and it'll short out against the commutator, and then the motor will just be running in induction mode. And also, this ring will move inside the brush holder assembly, and that will push those fingers forward, and that'll take the tension off the carbon brushes when the motor's in action. So I'm gonna set the end bell on here so you can see what I'm talking about. So I have the uh, carbon brushes removed just so that uh, you can see in here a little bit better. So I have the end bell set up on the rotor, but I left a little bit of space in there so that you can see how they interact. So this ring right here is what I was talking about. Uh, this ring is held in uh, place with the spring tension. So when those fly weights open up, the two rods that are inside there push this uh, ring and the short circuiting mechanism forward. The ring goes inside here and it pushes the four fingers down. And when that happens, Okay, you can see there the flat spring with the brush, it takes the pressure off of it so that the brushes aren't riding on the commutator and wearing out so quickly, and it also quiets it down. So uh, once we tear this rotor apart, you'll be able to see the individual pieces of the rotor, but uh, it's important to understand the interaction of the rotor and the brush holder assembly to really uh, get a grasp of how these uh, beautiful motors work. So lastly, uh, if you look at this bolt right here, you see it has two sets of threads on it. It has a larger set and then it has a real small set at the top. The purpose of that is the small set just threads into this bracket and the larger set threads into the housing and that you use to control the amount of uh, pressure that's on that carbon brush and then you lock it in place with the, uh, with the nut that's on there. So that's how those operate. So when I remove the uh, carbon brushes from the motor, I see that a previous owner attempted to uh, repair a cracked carbon brush with some JB Weld or some epoxy or something like that. 
Uh, I don't recommend doing that. First of all, JB Weld does not conduct electricity. You go on their website, it tells you right there. Um, second of all, that, that's really not the right way to do it. If you can't find the, uh, the proper wedge uh, shaped brush, what you could do is you could find just any large carbon brush and just file it down. These brushes file down real easy with a metal file. And if you're on eBay, for example, and you search under like elevator brushes, you'll see some very large rectangular shaped uh, brushes like this one. And you could just file it down into the wedge shape you need. That's a far better option than trying to glue it back together. That's really uh, not the right way to do it. And also going back to the fingers, I have a collection of uh, extra fingers here because they do wear out occasionally. And I mentioned earlier that uh, if your fingers were worn out and uh, you wanted to uh, eliminate them that you could do that. Um, the other thing that you could do um, that has been done successfully by some people, I, I haven't done it because I have some extras, but uh, I do believe it would work, is you could actually weld a little bit on the end here and then file it down to the proper shape. So um, that's another option if you're having an issue with the fingers being worn out, is just to either just put a little dab of weld here and file it to shape or actually carefully weld on another little uh, piece of metal there. So anyways, uh, those are a couple options you have for your brushes and uh, for those fingers. Okay, so we got the brush holder assembly back together and I have adjusted the tension on the Gibbs screws where these brushes just have enough play in them uh, to move around freely within the holder, uh, but they do not fit in there sloppily. So uh, this piece is gonna be good to go uh, when the time comes that we begin to reassemble. Okay, so here we're taking a look at the uh, bearing inside one of the end bells, and I don't have any intention on removing those bearings because they appear to be in like new condition. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the video, this motor has ring oilers and that's probably the best lubrication system possible for these sleeve bearings because the bearings are getting a constant stream of oil applied to them while the motor's running. So I'm going to set up a little demo and just kind of show you how that works. Okay, so this is what the setup would look like inside the end bell. Uh, so here's your rotor, there's your bearing, and that's the ring. And you can see there's an opening in that bearing and that allows that ring to ride around while the shaft is spinning and just constantly deposit oil onto the shaft and uh, it's always lubricated. Okay, so now we're at the part where we're going to begin the disassembly of the rotor and before you take apart a rotor like this, you definitely want to take some detailed photos because it has a bunch of parts. And if you're not familiar with it, it's easy to get confused once you have everything disassembled. Uh, one of the most important things to pay attention to is how many threads are exposed right here. So you want to count how many threads are exposed so that when you put it back together, you could put it back together in the same orientation in which you took it apart. Okay, so this pin right here is just an alignment pin, and you're going to remove that before you do anything else, and that pin just pulls straight out. Now, this collar is threaded onto this shaft, and behind this collar is a large spring. The purpose of this collar is to adjust the amount of tension that's on the large spring behind it, and by increasing or decreasing the tension on the spring, you can control how early or late these flyweights open up. So what that translates to is if the motor's taking too long to switch over from repulsion mode to induction mode, you can adjust the tension on that collar and you can force that action to happen earlier or later. Okay, so looking at this end, uh, you can see that uh, these flyweights are held in place with this bolt. But this bolt is secured inside here with a cotter pin and there's some spacers in here. So uh, once again, make sure you know where everything goes before you start taking it apart. This whole mechanism here right now is under a tremendous amount of pressure because the spring is in place. So you could only take it apart from this end first. You won't be able to do anything with this until you remove that spring and take the pressure off of this side. 
I want to point out that these strips right here, those are called insulating strips. And underneath those strips are wires. There's some occasions when the bearings on these motors have worn out and the rotor may actually make contact uh, with the stator. And that actually happened on a one horsepower century motor that I was restoring. And it is possible if that happens, if this ever uh, hits the stator while it's running, these segments can actually move and they'll be out of whack. They almost look like a bunch of crooked teeth. Um, so if your rotor has these segments out of whack, you can actually move them back into position using a pin punch and a hammer. Just go along and whack it with the hammer and just straighten those out because what you don't want is you don't want these segments pinching on these wires because that could cause a problem with short circuits so you can tap them back in place it is a little bit time consuming but um, it's imperative that these are straight on this particular rotor these are already nice and straight so i don't need to do that but i wanted to bring that to your attention in case uh, your rotor has that problem Thing we're going to do before we start disassembling the rotor is just to do a simple continuity test on it just to make sure that there's no uh, major short circuits on it so the segments of the commutator uh, they should have continuity with each other but they should not have continuity with the shaft and they should not have continuity with these segments here nor should they have continuity with the uh, flyweight back here so if you i just got this set on the uh, on the resistance setting here and I got it set at 200 which is the lowest setting on this uh, particular meter and so if I just put the probes here so that's 1.8 and move to the next one 1.8 1 1.8 1 and you're just gonna go around and make sure that all of those have continuity and then when I take the probes and I put it to the shaft you can see that uh, there's no fault there and conversely if I take the probe and I put it here you can see that uh, there's no fault there and there's no fault over here so uh, we'll just go around and check all those segments and uh, then we'll start disassembly Okay, so to begin disassembly, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put a witness mark on the collar here so that I remember which hole of this guide pin went into. Now the next step is going to be to remove this pin and that should pull straight out. Okay, so it required a little bit of force to get it out of there, but uh, that's what it looks like once it's removed. So this is the setup that I have to remove this uh, threaded collar from the shaft. The reason why I have the uh, vice grips clamped on here, of course I'm using a, a rag to protect the shaft, is because the spring is really under a lot of pressure, and I don't want that collar coming out and hitting me in the face when... Uh, when it lets loose so I got the vice grip on there just as a uh, safety measure and I do have a spanner wrench but uh, my spanner wrench isn't quite the right size for this it it's off by about a, about an eighth of an inch uh, so what I'm gonna do in order to remove that collar is I'm just gonna take a, a pin punch and I'm just gonna stick it in there and tap it down with a hammer and just work my way around uh, that's the only option I have right now so I'll bring you guys back once I do that Okay, so it's a damn good thing I had that vice grip set up over there because let me tell you, that thing came out of there with a lot of tension. As you can see, that's a thick, heavy spring, so it's got a lot of uh, force behind it when it lets loose. So make sure that you have some kind of safety device in place for that when that happens. Now, when I go to reassemble that, because of the, uh, the amount of pressure that's on this spring, I won't be able to cheat like I did when I got it apart. 
uh, getting it apart, I just cheated and used my pin punch to get it apart because my spanners didn't quite fit. But uh, putting it back together, I'm definitely going to have to have the proper spanners to do it. So uh, I'll either have to modify the set that I have or buy another set uh, to get back to get that back together. So um, anyways, I'm going to take this vice grip off of here and we'll continue with the disassembly. So as I get ready to remove the shorting necklace, I just want to take a little bit of a closer look so that you can see exactly uh, the orientation of these pieces here. So here's the spring, here's the threaded collar that we removed first, and now this piece right here, let me get the spring out of the way, so this just fits in there like that. Once you have that spring off of there and that, and that collar, you could just pull this out by hand, and as you do that, you're going to expose the short circuiting necklace. And there she is right there. And as you can see, the uh, wire holding the segments of the uh, short circuiting necklace appears to be broken. So uh, we'll have to repair that before we put it back together. So the shorting necklace just rests inside this ridge right here. So lastly, you could see that there's a washer inside of there. So um, I'm going to use a little hook in that little hole that's in there and just pull that flat washer out of there. Okay, so as we look inside the rotor, you can see those two rods that I was talking about. And those are the rods that move back and forth uh, along with the flyweights. So if I take one of these flyweights back here, and get you in there so you can see it a little better. And I move that, you see that rod moving back and forth? So that's how that operates. Now that we have the uh, tension and we have the front disassembled on the commutator side, we can focus our attentions on the other side. Okay, so we need to remove these two bolts here and in order to do that this cotter pin needs to be removed uh, this one is really rusty so it's probably just going to break off and then in between these two flanges there's a spacer in there and then there's a spacer here and the bolt here so first thing is going to be to remove that cotter pin So now that we have those bolts and the spacers removed, uh, that allows us to move these flyweights out of the way. And once we move those out of the way, we can see that there's another set of cotter pins and uh, there's a washer right inside there. There's one over there 
and there's one back there. It's a little bit difficult to see in there, but right at the end of that awl is where the cotter pins are. So once I remove those two cotter pins, uh, that will allow this flyweight and the rod and everything just to pull out of there. Uh, now these pieces, this, this arm here, and the rod, those are riveted together. So there's no reason to, uh, to separate those. But by removing this completely out of here, that'll allow me to put that in some evapor rust and uh, get all that corrosion that's off of there and get those cleaned and lubricated before we put everything back together. So the next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and remove those two cotter pins and we'll bring you guys right back. Okay, so I got that cotter pin out of there and that just broke apart because it was all corroded. Now I'm gonna move that flat washer out of there. And then uh, once that's removed, we should be able to remove this whole linkage with the rod and the flyweight and everything uh, connected together. Okay, so now that we have the, uh, the flat washer removed, this disconnects from that pin back there. And now we can carefully remove the whole assembly. And that's what it looks like when it's broken down. And as I mentioned before, these linkages are riveted together. So there's really no reason to take those apart. You can just drill this whole uh, mechanism in a bath of evapor rust and get it cleaned up and then just put it back together the way it is and put a little lubrication on there. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna repeat that same procedure for this side. So here's a better look inside the other end of the rotor. Now what I'll be focusing on is uh, cleaning and removing all the corrosion. I'll apply a layer of paint inside of uh, this end of the rotor just to uh, provide a little bit of rust protection. We'll get the uh, flyweight mechanism soaking in some evapor rust, and uh, then we'll work on these windings and uh, getting the rest of it cleaned up, including the uh, commutator. We're gonna undercut those segments uh, on the commutator and get that cleaned up. So uh, still got a lot of work to go on this rotor. So upon closer inspection, I can see that there's actually another threaded collar on this back side. And I'm gonna try to remove that using a pin punch and a hammer, just like I did a, a collar on the front side because if I'm able to remove this end piece here, that will allow me better access to the inside of the rotor to clean it and to uh, remove any corrosion that's in there. So I'll try to get that off and we'll see what happens. I'll bring you guys back. All right, so the end of this rotor appears to be uh, just lightly pressed on there. It doesn't seem to be on there real tightly. Um, so what I've done is I've taken this slide hammer and I've put it in one of the openings uh, that was in this end piece here. And uh, I'm just very carefully uh, using that slide hammer and then hopefully this is just gonna slide off of here. There is a keyway, uh, it is keyed in there. So um, it, it doesn't rotate from side to side. It's just gotta come off straight. So uh, I'll just keep playing around with that and uh, I'll bring you guys back once I get this piece off. As you can see, it's completely filthy and corroded inside there, so uh, we'll definitely have our work cut out for us uh, getting this thing cleaned up. So that'll be the next part. So I'm a few hours into the uh, work on this rotor, and what I've done so far is I spent quite a bit of time cleaning out each one of those bores. I removed all the rust out of there and cleaned everything out, and then I used a uh, round brush and I painted inside of uh, all those openings um, so that no rust will form in there in the future. Uh, I've also gone ahead and I've cleaned the windings on the inside here of the back end of the rotor and uh, I've applied it the first coat of the uh, red insulating varnish and then uh, I'm going to apply another coat of that uh, insulating varnish in there 
and then um, when I'm done with it, I will spray these windings black um, just to make them look a little bit better when it's finished. But uh, anyways, first I got to put the insulating varnish on there. So I'm trying to get the back end of this rotor finished first, and then I'll uh, worry about the other end. All right, so I got the uh, red insulating varnish on the rotor, and then after that dried, I uh, got it covered with the uh, black paint, and that was just to uh, change the color. I used some bluing, and I blued those segments, and I put a little bit of wood stain on the uh, insulating strips. And uh, so far, it's looking good. It's still got a long way to go on it, but uh, happy with the way that it's turning out so far. All right, so I'm at the part now on the uh, rotor where I'm trying to get the commutator into good condition. And uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that this commutator is cleaned up because it tends to wear in the middle and it'll be a little bit higher on the inner and outer edges because it tends to wear out where the uh, brushes ride. So if you have a lathe, you can uh, put it on the lathe and just take a skim cut just to clean up these uh, commutator segments. If you don't have a lathe, then uh, what I like to do is I like to use a large metal file. And when I say large, I mean something that hangs over the diameter of the commutator. That way you can take down the inner and outer edges until they uh, meet up with the center, like that. It takes a little bit, but it works, it works well. And then the other thing that you wanna do with the uh, commutator is you want to undercut these segments. So you want the mica, which is the insulation material in between the segments, you want that to be below the surface so that it doesn't hit the carbon brushes and cause sparking. Um, they do make a, a, a lathe that undercuts uh, mica, but assuming that you don't have that, uh, an easy way to do it is to just use the hacksaw blade. And all you need to do is run your hacksaw blade in between the segments like that and just go back and forth and just get it undercut just like that now it is a little bit time consuming to go around and to uh, do each one of those segments but um, that's what it takes to get the job done correctly so that's what we're going to do then after I get all of these undercut then I'll go back around again and just polish it out and because once in a while that'll raise up a little burr there so after everything is finished you want to go and knock off any burrs that you raised up uh, when you undercut the mica here you can see the job we did undercutting the mica on the commutator uh, I began with the hacksaw blade and I undercut each segment using that hacksaw blade and then to finish it I used this cutoff wheel in the Dremel and I went along and uh, cleaned out each segment and it really worked great. So uh, the commutator looks fantastic. All I'll do now is just polish it up a little bit and we're ready to move on to the next step. Continuing the uh, reassembly of the rotor, I'm now working on this housing which we removed and this is the housing that holds the uh, flyweight mechanism. So I've cleaned and de-rusted that uh, put a coat of clear coat on there just to uh, prevent any rust from forming in the future and as you can see here there was insulation strips uh, that protected that from rubbing against the uh, windings of the rotor so it was originally wrapped in like a white uh, linen but that linen was all dry rotted so I'm reusing the original strips because those are in good condition but I'm replacing the uh, the white linen with some uh, black friction tape and then on the bottom, this is insulated from the inside of the rotor. There's like a gasket that's uh, glued inside the bottom of the rotor. But I'm also going to take a little bit of uh, liquid electrical tape. And I'm just going to put a very thin coat on the bottom of that where that meets up against that gasket. That'll just provide a little bit more uh, insulation there.
So the two flyweights uh, just slide onto these two pins that are over here. And now I'll get in there. There's a washer and a cotter pin that uh, secure those in place. There's not really a lot of room to get the camera in there. So I just want you to kind of get a look at uh, how that goes back together. Got that uh, last cotter pin in right there. So this side is complete. Now we'll begin the commutator side. Okay, so we're at the part where we have to uh, fabricate a new shorting necklace uh, because the wire that holds all the uh, segments together of the shorting necklace, the original wire was broken. Uh, this wire was about 28 thousandths uh, thick, which translates into approximately a 22 gauge uh, steel wire. So I have a, a 22 gauge replacement here. I'm going to, uh, I've already cleaned each one of these segments individually, and I'm going to thread them on here and uh, get this thing back together. The total length of this uh, particular necklace is about eight and a quarter inches plus the two little loops at the end. So uh, let me get back that back together and uh, we'll carry on. I've already installed the large flat washer uh, inside the rotor prior to uh, inserting the shorting necklace here. So this is the setup I got to use to uh, put this collar on there and uh, as I mentioned before that spring is under a tremendous amount of tension so uh, I had to grind down my uh, spanner wrench so that I can uh, have the clearance to fit around that shaft um, but I already did that I already ground that down so we're good to go as far as that's concerned. Now what I'll do is uh, I'm going to take a piece of pipe and I'll put a piece of pipe over this whole thing and uh, probably just lean down on it with all my weight and uh, say a few bad words and hopefully we're going to get it on there. I'll bring you back when I'm uh, done with that. So what I ended up doing was uh, putting a piece of pipe over that thing where I could get some good pressure on it and then uh, using the spanner wrench here to get it on. It actually went on easier than I thought but uh, I was prepared for the worst in case that happened. Uh, now I got it threaded down. This is exactly uh, where it was before. I looked at my reference photographs and I also had put that little witness mark in there before. So this hole is where that uh, retaining pin goes in. So now we're just going to uh, put that retaining pin back in here. Just 
Just like that. This rotor is ready to go. All right, so I actually had to uh, take this rotor back apart for a second. Um, I failed to use my own reference photos, and uh, when I was putting it back together, I realized that this little washer right here, that actually goes in between those two flanges and uh, not on the bottom. So uh, the reference photos aren't really much good if I didn't take a look at them when uh, I'm putting it back together. And the other thing that I wanted to mention since I have this thing back apart is on the shorting necklace, uh, these little segments are shaped kind of like the letter C. They stick out here and they stick out here and they're hollowed out in the middle. So this side should be the outside. This is the side that should be uh, touching against the commutator and the other side should be the inside. So um, I failed to mention that before. So anyways, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and switch this washer around in between these two flanges and put this thing back together. So before we uh, begin working on the stator, I just wanted to make a couple basic tests on the windings to kind of get a gauge of where we're at before we get started. So the first thing that I did was uh, a resistance test on the windings, and uh, you just want to make sure that your pairs of windings have a, a similar resistance, uh, which they do in this case. Uh, the other thing that I did was a mega test, and the mega result on this, it was about 5 mega ohms, which is uh, it's a medium uh, rating i mean it's not the best um but it's definitely not the worst uh, as a matter of fact when i first got this motor i measured the windings and <laughs> they didn't have any resistance at all uh whoever had this motor uh, before me had the thing sitting outside and uh, these things were completely packed with uh, sawdust and grease and i swept them out a little bit uh, when i first got it anyways um, sawdust and grease and things like that and sitting outside in a humid environment <clears throat> will definitely affect the uh, mega readings and I haven't even worked on these windings but just the fact of uh, being inside uh, it did raise the mega reading some so anyways after we do our cleaning and uh, rewiring of these uh, windings we will put the heating pad on there before we apply our varnish and uh, I'm confident that that mega reading is going to come up somewhat uh, once we put the heating pad on there. Uh, but for right now, the uh, mega reading is acceptable, so that it's not uh, anything fatal. So we're going to go ahead and um, start working on this stator. I did number these leads, uh, one, two, three, and four, just in the order that they come out of the uh, housing there, just to make it easier to uh, remember which one is which. So we'll go ahead and get started. So there's two drive rivets that uh, secure this uh, ceramic housing in place. And uh, I took a wire brush and I just cleaned in there a little bit so you, I can uh, find the uh, drive rivets. And there's one here and there's one right down here. So I'm just going to use a pin punch and uh, punch those out of there. So now what we're doing is we're continuing to take these four lead wires and uh, we're going to cut them all the way back to the junction where they actually uh, join up with the wires coming out of the stator itself. So I'm going to cut off this electrical tape and then uh, snip those wires right here and we'll be soldering on new leads uh, from that junction point forward. So i got to do that for uh, the rest of these. I got one off and i got to do the other three. 
So now I'm at uh, one of the most tedious parts of any motor restoration, and that is the removal of the old and dry rotted uh, wrapping that's around these windings. Um, there's no easy or fast way to do it. You really have to be careful because uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be doing any damage to the windings when you're in there. Um, so what I do is I just carefully cut these and uh, get in there with some tweezers and uh, just spend some time removing all of that. The reason why I do that is because it allows a much better saturation of the varnish when the time comes that uh, we go to put the varnish on. So anyways, uh, cleaning the windings on both sides of this uh, stator is going to take a number of hours. So uh, I'll go ahead and work on it and uh, bring you guys back. I'm in the middle of working on the stator and on the front side of the motor being the uh, shaft side, there's a cast iron ring here that helps to uh, secure the stator in place. And the reason for that ring is just to keep the stator from uh, vibrating free. Uh, it's unlikely that that would happen. That thing's pressed in there pretty tight, but that ring just helps to secure it in place. Anyways, this cast iron ring is held in place with set screws and these set screws actually sit behind the four bolts that hold the end bell on. So after you remove the end bell, buried deep inside there, each one of these holes has set screws in it. And once you have these loosened, and let me tell you, they are a pain in the ass to get loosened. So I had to use a torch and heat each one of these up to get them out because uh, every single one of them was corroded really badly. So be ready for a battle. But um, once, you, once you get these out, this ring, once I move these here, just got those there so you can see them. Now this ring will be loose. This ring rotates like that, and then you could take that ring off. And by taking that ring off, it will allow you better access to the inside of the stator to clean it and paint it and do what you gotta do. Plus, because these set screws and these holes were corroded so badly, I want to uh, chase the threads on all of these set screws. And when I put those back in, I'll put a little bit of anti-seize lubricant in there so that uh, sometime in the future, if somebody's ever taken this apart, they'll have an easier time with it than I did. So with that cast iron ring removed, you have plenty of room in here to work and to uh, fix up the windings, do any painting, whatever you need to do. Um, there's absolutely no reason to try to press the stator out the rest of the way. I mean, unless you were in a situation where it had to be rewound. Um, but aside from that, that's as far as this thing needs to be broken down. And uh, I'm gonna continue cleaning these windings and uh, making the repairs. So I got the windings as clean as they're gonna get and they really look great. Uh, as you can see here, got all the uh, old insulation removed off of them and everything looks uh, nice and clean. Additionally, uh, while we're inside here, I cleaned up the inside of the stator a little bit. And just like on the rotor, if you have a situation where the rotor had made contact with the stator, it is possible that these segments here could move out of whack. And uh, as I described earlier, sometimes it looks like a bunch of crooked teeth. And if your motor has that situation where these are moved out of alignment, this is the time that you want to take a pin punch and a hammer and you want to straighten these out so that these insulation strips run nice and straight because as I mentioned previously there's wires that run along here and you don't want those wires to get pinched and cause a problem with short circuits so these on this particular stator are already nice and straight but if yours aren't this is the time you want to correct that so what we'll be doing next is there's some repairs that need to be made in here I need to replace some of this friction tape here here and uh, also we'll have to be soldering on some new leads and i'll also be painting inside here to uh, prevent any rust from forming in the future so those will be the next steps that we'll be taking with the stator so we've got the uh, heating pad inside here and as you can see i have the uh, stator covered up with a couple towels and uh, we're going to let these windings get dried out thoroughly uh, before we attempt to apply the insulating varnish, it's imperative that the uh, windings be warm and dry. 
I've already gone ahead and I've put some uh, heat shrink tubing where it was necessary and I've repaired a couple of the areas that had the uh, the old friction tape so uh, those areas are good to go so uh, we're just gonna let this thing dry out real good and then I'll check it with the mega and uh, we'll let the readings come up on the mega as far as they can and then we'll begin the process of applying the insulating varnish so in the end it ended up taking about a day and a half for these windings to dry out the way that I wanted them to. Uh, originally I had these things set up outside in my work area here, but uh, I live in Florida and the humidity was just kind of working against me. So I ended up uh, taking the motor inside the house into the air conditioning. And of course the humidity is a lot lower there. And uh, I let the windings dry out for a day inside there. And uh, the mega reading on these windings ended up coming up to uh, about 20 mega ohms which is very respectable for a motor that's uh, over 115 years old. So uh, that was a nice solid reading, but it did take, I mean, it started out all the way at the bottom of the meter and ended up uh, close to the top when we were finished. So that worked out good. Now I'm in the process of uh, brushing on the insulating varnish. And for this project, I'm starting out with the, uh, the Gliptol, the red insulating varnish with a brush, and I'm really putting it on there heavy. Um, I'm kind of slathering it on there. I really want it to saturate in between those windings. And uh, I'm not worried if it drips out a little bit. We could always clean that up later. But I want to make sure that those windings are fully saturated. And then uh, once I finish with these, I'll set it up with a space heater and I'll let those dry thoroughly. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a long, thin nozzle on my spray insulating varnish. And I'm going to get into the nooks and crannies that I couldn't quite reach with the uh, brush. So it's important that these have a nice liberal coating of the varnish on there. And uh, like I said, we'll use the space heater to make sure that they dry thoroughly. So, so far they're really coming out good. So I've hit these windings with a coat of heat resistant black spray paint. So now I'm at the point where I'm soldering on the four lead wires and uh, we'll be bringing them out here through the pecker head. And uh, this is a 10 gauge wire. Uh, this motor is rated to draw 22 amps uh, at full load on 110. So it's a pretty hefty draw. So uh, this wire being a 10 gauge will be uh, more than adequate for that kind of uh, amperage. And uh, after I soldered the connections on here, I put two layers of heat shrink tubing on here. And then we're gonna wrap this whole thing with the uh, black friction tape to give it a neater appearance and we'll uh, wrap these around here so that they look nice and neat and bring them out over here. So that's what we're working on right now. Okay, so I'm at the part where I've reinstalled the retaining ring that uh, helps to secure this stator into position and uh, I've applied some friction tape uh, to the inside edge of it because the original one had some protection in that area and that's just to keep it from uh, rubbing against the windings. And when I go to put these set screws in here, uh, there's four long ones and four short ones. The short ones go behind the bolts that secure the end bell on. Anyways, we'll be applying some anti-seize lubricant to those because they were pretty corroded uh, when we took them out of there the first time. So this is the time I'll be using the precision ground flat stones to remove any burrs from the end bells so that they fit together properly.
So I got everything laid out here and we're ready to do our final assembly and give this motor a test run. So as we get ready to wrap this uh, already long video up, I just wanted to touch on a couple other points uh, that you may run across if you have one of these motors. Uh, the first thing is occasionally you'll find a situation where your motor is just humming when you apply power to it. And if that's the case, uh, the first thing you want to check is to make sure that this switch is exactly lined up where it needs to be. If this bolt works its way loose and this switch wanders between these two points, that could cause the motor to just sit there and hum. So make sure that that's fastened and in the correct place. The other thing that it could be, and I had this situation on a one horsepower century that I restored, is that you have one of these leads reversed. Um, what happened with the one horsepower motor is that it had been rewound. And after they rewound it, they had the leads coming out in a different order than they did from the factory. So when I plugged it in, it was just sitting there humming. Anyway, these windings have a, a kind of a polarity to them. So if your motor's humming and you know that the switch is in the correct position, the first thing I would try to do is uh, reverse one of those leads and see if that makes a difference. The other thing that I want to mention on this motor is the tag actually has a misprint. And if you look right up there, it shows 11.2 amps, uh, which is a misprint. That's the amperage for a one horsepower motor, and this is a two horsepower motor. So the amperage on this uh, motor is actually double that. It's 22.4 amps. So that's kind of unusual. Also, this tag is really in beautiful condition. So uh, when I put the motor back together, I did not do anything to that tag whatsoever. I didn't clear coat it, nothing. It's really, uh, it's hard to find a tag in such beautiful original condition. So we just left that be. Um, Another thing that I wanted to mention is the rotor. I weighed the rotor and the rotor weighs 56 pounds. So you can imagine once that thing starts spinning, it's pretty hard to slow it down. It really gets a lot of inertia behind it once it gets going. I mentioned earlier in the video that I took the rotor back apart because I inadvertently placed the spacers in the wrong position when I was putting it together the first time. And uh, what I didn't mention was when I put it back together the second time, I actually replaced those washers with some new ones uh, because the new ones were just a couple thousandths of an inch thicker and that eliminated 100% of any play that was in that flyweight mechanism. I did not use a commutator stone to seat the brushes on this commutator because uh, the motor is running fantastic just the way it is. Um, when you have a radial commutator like this one where the brushes lift off it's kind of difficult to use a commutator stone because by the time you get it on there the brushes lift off so um, one way around that is to start up the motor with a variac where you can keep it running slow for a couple seconds so you can get the uh, commutator stone in there or you could also turn the uh, rotor by hand of course that's going to take a little bit longer uh, alternatively the other thing that you could do is just start and stop the motor a bunch of times and those brushes will uh, wear in. But in this case, it wasn't really necessary to use it. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention is that when I took this motor apart, there was no thrust washers in there. And those thrust washers are really important for controlling the movement of the rotor back and forth. And they are particularly important when you have a radial commutator like this one. Because if there's a lot of play in that rotor back and forth, and that rotor happens to work its way away from the carbon brushes you could have a situation where those carbon brushes aren't making good contact with it because there's too much play back and forth so with this particular motor there was no washers in there the, there's not any excessive play in there so i didn't add any um, but that's an important thing to be aware of is that there's not too much play so that the rotor is not sitting too far away from those carbon brushes Also, after testing this motor, I'm perfectly comfortable with the adjustment of the collar on the rotor. Uh, if you'll recall, I mentioned that the collar on the rotor, you can adjust that to adjust the spring tension. And by doing so, you can control the action 
uh, whether or not the flyweights release earlier or later. Um, but in this case, I, I returned the rotor to where the uh, collar was before I took it apart, and I feel that um, the placement of that collar is satisfactory. The motor is starting uh, perfectly, so I don't see any reason to adjust that. But it's important to remember that if necessary, you can adjust the, uh, the opening of those weights uh, as needed. I want to uh, take a second to talk about lubrication for these electric motors. If your motor has wick oilers and it works through capillary action where the oil soaks in through a wick which then rubs on the shaft, uh, what you want to do is you want to use a 10 weight oil such as Zoom Spout which is a non-detergent 10 weight oil. And that oil is a little bit lighter weight and the lighter weight oil helps to facilitate the capillary action that a wick oiler uses. In this motor, as you can see, we have ring oilers. And the ring oiler works by the ring spinning around the shaft, picking up the oil from the oil sump, and depositing it on top of the shaft. For these type of motors, you want to use a 20 weight non-detergent oil, such as the 3-in-1 electric motor oil that comes in a blue bottle. The reason why you want to use a 20 weight oil for the ring oilers is because the slightly heavier weight oil helps to keep the oil from flinging off the ring as it's spinning around. So these recommendations came straight out of a Century Motor brochure. Uh, so it's 10 weight for the wick oilers, 20 weight for the ring oilers. On the topic of uh, lubrication systems, it's important to note that I did not need to change the uh, sleeve bearings in this motor. And I find it absolutely fascinating to think that this motor still has its original bearings in there. When you consider how old this motor is, for it to still have its original bearings in there and for those bearings to be in such good and tight condition as they are is really, uh, it's really something. Um, so anyways, that's a tribute to the simple but effective design of these ring oilers and uh, on top of that it did save me a small amount of work because I didn't have to uh, pull out those bearings but the original bearings on this motor are in perfect condition So now this Century motor is finished and I couldn't be more pleased with the way that it turned out. Uh, in total I spent about 65 hours on this project and uh, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, I noticed video is a little bit long but I tried to put a lot of information in there. I cut out all the parts about painting and polishing up parts and all that and just tried to uh, keep the nuts and bolts of it so I hope that you enjoyed following along. Uh, right now I just have this motor set up here for demonstration purposes. I actually have it sitting on, my, on a Lazy Susan. And uh, when the time comes that I actually mount this motor permanently, then I'll go ahead and level it. And uh, also I may just fine tune those gib screws on the brushes. Uh, the motor runs really quiet, but you could hear the brushes just rattling around in their holders a little bit, which is completely normal. So once I have the motor uh, where I want it permanently, then I could just make a little fine tune adjustments as necessary. So anyways, I hope that uh, you found this video useful and we look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you very much for watching.